sacrifice of the head ram to the gods. You try to find your way to Ithaca. Almost forgot. That lotus was really good. Once more, we are in the Odyssey. Once again, we are escaping the fall of Troy, or leaving it rather, because we caused it, and uh, being with Odysseus, we had the Isle of the Lotus Eaters, then we narrowly, using our wits and courage, escaped and eluded the deadly grasp of the Cyclops. Set sail for Ithaca once again, but I don't think we're out of the fire yet. And uh, so, once again, guys, this we have Odysseus, his wife and son, who we have yet to see, Menelaus, Helen, Agamemnon. We've yet to see, well, anybody over here except Odysseus. Okay. And we have the main god, ruler of the gods, Zeus. His brother Poseidon, daughter Athena. And then the god of And then we have the messenger god, Hermes. And for our story, the sun god, Hyperion. And for very, very important to our story today is the goddess of enchantment, Circe. Calypso, the goddess of silence. And we already know the Cyclops, Polyphemus, the son of Poseidon. Okay, so there's Odysseus plowing at the gun, despite, despite going to Troy, burning Troy, wandering upon one of his stone. even though he was blind, 
Polyphemus says, Great Poseidon, Earth Shaker, Lord of the Waves, hear me if I am your son, and if you are my father, grant me this. May Odysseus never see his home again, or if he does, let him come alone and friendless to a house of trouble and sorrow. And that was his prayer. And Poseidon heard it. And Odysseus then sacrificed a ram, the ram on which he had escaped, and prayed to Zeus. But Zeus would do nothing to turn aside. goddess of enchantment. Next, Odysseus and his ships came to the island home of Aeolus, who is the warden of the winds. His island floats on the surface of the sea, and all around it is a wall of bronze. Aeolus lives there with his wife and twelve children six sons and six daughters who are married to one another and they spend all their time feasting. For a whole month Aeolus entertained Odysseus and his men and questioned them closely about the fall of Troy. At last Odysseus patiently asked Aeolus for his help on the journey home. Without it, without it, we will never see it again, for the gods are against us. So Aeolus gave Odysseus an ox hide bag tied with a silver cord. In it were all the winds. they were needed, except for the west wind, which Aeolus commanded to give Odysseus safe passage home. First all went well. After nine days and nine nights, the shore of Ithaca came into sight. Odysseus, who had been keeping lookout all this time, fell asleep. Sure, 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 that his long journey home was nearly over. And his crew So the foolish and greedy men undid the silver cord around the oxide bag and let out the wind. At once, 
a fierce tempest arose, buffeting the ships with merciless fury. One by one they foundered. They sank to the bottom of the sea, and the waves closed over them. Soon only Odysseus's ship was left. The wearing winds, the warring winds, blew it all the way back to Aeolus' island. He greeted Odysseus with amazement. <laughs> amazement? What are you doing back here? He asked. Did I not give you command of the winds to see you home safely? You did, answered Odysseus. But my companions have betrayed me. They opened the oxide bag and then let loose the tempest. I beg you, I beg you, gather the winds together again so I can go home. The gods are truly against you, said Aeolus. I cannot help you again. Go, go, get out of here, you silly, silly Greek. Odysseus, heavy at heart, turned once more to the open sea. No friendly wind filled his sails this time. Instead, the men had to pull on the oars against both wind and wave. And all the time they knew, no matter what course they steered, that Poseidon was waiting for them. So Odysseus and his men eventually made landfall off the island of Asia, the home of Circe, the goddess, the goddess of enchantment. When they had beached the ship, Odysseus climbed a nearby hill to see what he could. As he stood gazing over the island, a stag crossed his path on its way to drink from the river. Odysseus flung his spear and killed it. Men, he cried, our luck is with us once again. Come, let us feast, and tomorrow we shall explore the island. Next day Odysseus divided his crew into two parties. He commanded the first, his cousin Eurylochus, Eurylochus the second. They drew lots as to who should go first, and Eurylochus won. So he and twenty-two men set off inland. Here we have Circe's, Circe's palace. Well, before long, they came to Circe's palace. It stood in a clearing in the woodland and was built of stone. Wild creatures such as lions and wolves roamed outside it, but Circe's power was so great that they did not attack the men, but fawned over them like dogs. When the party came to the doors of the palace, they could hear Circe inside, singing in, in a lovely, lilting voice, as she worked at her loom, weaving such dazzling gossamer cloth as goddesses make. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Then Polites said, There is a woman in the house singing as she weaves. The whole building rings with the echoes of her voice. Come in. Let us go in. So they entered with no suspicion in their hearts. Only Eurylochus waited outside ill, ill at ease. But the goddess welcomed them. She served them wine and sweet meats, mixing in them drugs that made them forget their country and their loved ones and long only to serve Circe. Then she touched each of them lightly with a rod and as she did they turned into bristly snuffling swine. Hogs, pigs, boars, kind of like Pinocchio and his friends turning into donkeys at Pleasure Island. remain the minds of men though but when they tried to cry for help only grunts came out and Eurylochus saw it all and ran back to the ship with the terrible news the men wanted to sail at once abandoning Polites and the others but Odysseus would not leave them made his way alone to Circe's palace, Odysseus met Hermes, the messenger god, with his golden wand and winged, golden winged sandals. He looked like a boy on the edge of manhood, with the first soft down still on his upper lip. Nevertheless, Odysseus bowed low, knowing that he was in the presence of a god. Unlucky man, said Hermes. You can never free your companions from Circe's power. But wait, here grows an herb that will keep you safe from her witches' potions. It's called Moli. And while you carry it, no harm can come to you. Circe she touches you with her rod, you must draw your sword and as if to strike her. Then she will beg you to be her lover, and you must agree, for she is a goddess after all. But first make her swear to do you no harm, otherwise she may steal away your courage and manhood as you lie naked in your bed. So. Hermes departed, and Odysseus continued to walk his way toward Circe's palace. When he reached the door, he cried out to be let in. Circe welcomed him, ushered him to a chair, and handed him a golden goblet in which she had mixed her potion. But when he had drunk, she touched him with a rod saying, Now, be off to the pigsty, and lie down with your friends. But he remained a man. He drew his sword and raised it high, as if to strike her dead. And Circe fell to her knees, and spoke in pleading tones. Who, who are you? How is it you can resist my magic?
Odysseus answered, How can I trust you when you have turned my men into swine? Promise to free them and to do me no further harm, and I will lie with you willingly. The goddess gave her promise. She opened the door of the sty, and Polites and the others came trotting out looking just like full-grown swine. Circe smeared an ointment onto them, and their bristles fell away, their snouts receded, their limbs lengthened. Soon they were standing up once again, looking yonder. Then as Circe's handmaidens prepared her bedchamber, Odysseus went back to the ship to tell Eurylochus and the others the news. The men would not believe him and wanted to put straight out to sea. But Odysseus told them, I have given my word to a goddess, and I cannot break it. When Odysseus and his men reached the palace, Circe welcomed them. Put aside your care, she said. Eat, drink, and be merry. For a year, Odysseus's men, for a year, Odysseus's men, feasted while Odysseus kept loving company with the goddess who bore him a son, Telegonus. At last, however, they grew homesick, and Odysseus begged Circe to help them go back to Ithaca. You have offended one of the most powerful gods, said Circe, and I cannot help you. If you want to return home, you must ask advice from the wisest of all the blind seer, Tiresias. But Tiresias is dead, said Odysseus. Yes, you must venture into Hades itself to speak with him. It will be worth the journey. For while the rest of the dead are mere fleeting shadows, Tiresias keeps his wits about him still. He alone can tell you what future holds. Who will pilot me on such a voyage? asked Odysseus. No sailor has ever undertaken the dark journey to the house of the dead. Do not worry, she replied. Hoist your white sail and the north wind will carry you where you wish to go. Once you have passed the river of the ocean, you will come to the coast of Hades with its black and blighted trees, and there you must leave your ship and walk into the land of the dead. When you come to a rock where two rivers meet, dig a trench and fill it with milk and honey. Add sweet wine, then water, and sprinkle barley meal upon it. Then, with the heartfelt prayers, you must promise that you, on your return to Ithaca, will make sacrifices to the dead, and to Tiresias especially. You must take a ram and an ewe and sacrifice them. The numberless hordes of the dead will swarm at the scent of blood, but you must hold them back with your sword until Tiresias arrives. He will answer your questions. Odysseus gathered his men and returned to the ship, but one did not come with them. 
he on the open arm. Having drunk too much wine, he was lying asleep on the palace roof. Hearing his companions calling for him, he, he leaped up, lost his footing, plummeted to the ground, and broke his neck. Odysseus, meanwhile, spoke to his men, No doubt you think we are heading for home, but we are not. Our destination is Hades, where the goddess has told me to seek the advice of the seer Tiresias. And the men took to the sea. They took to the sea once more. Now, the voyage to Hades. Odysseus and his crew did not have to touch the oars as the ship carried them to the dread land of the death. Circe's breeze filled the sail to speed them across the darkening sea to the very spot she had described. There Odysseus poured out milk, honey, sweet wine, water, and barley meal for the dead, and promised them a sacrifice when he should return to Ithaca. With many prayers and invocations, he slaughtered the ram and the ewe, and dark blood filled the trench. Ghosts flocked to the place of sacrifice, drawn by the vital energy still pulsing from the hot blood. Old men, young girls, battle heroes, peasants, their shades. Odysseus would not let any of the shades feast on the blood until Tiresias came, leaning on his golden staff. And here we go, we have the dark souls trying to feast on the trench of the still pulsing vitality of the blood. One even has his finger dipped right here. And here, in the very Draw back and let me drink, said Tiresias. Then I will reveal your future to you. Odysseus put up his sword, and Tiresias bent down to the streaming, steaming blood. Then he spoke. Prince Odysseus, you have come from the sunlight into the land of the shadow in order to learn of your fate. So listen, you seek a safe passage home, but this will not be easy, for you have offended the earth shaker, Poseidon. First, your cunning brought down the walls of Troy, which Poseidon himself had set up. Second, you have blinded his son, the Cyclops Polyphemus. You cannot hope to escape the anger of the gods completely, but if you are careful, you and your companions may yet come safely home. Be warned, if you arouse the wrath of the gods once more, the reward will be death and misery. 
you return home at all, it will be late and alone. You must hope it is not too late, for even now suitors of many lands are arriving at your palace and wooing your wife Penelope with fine gifts and finer words. Your son Telemachus is still a boy. How can he protect her? I will heed your words, whatever may befall, I shall not give up hope. When he was still an infant, my son Telemachus fell from a fisherman's boat into the salt sea, yet he was not lost. A dolphin carried him on its back, safe to shore, and that is why the seal on my ring shows a leaping dolphin. In the same way, surely the gods that weave my fate will bring me safely home at last. After that, Odysseus let each of the shades, one by one, be mm -hmm. sacrifice. And as they did so, they seemed to take on substance and remember themselves again. Odysseus. Odysseus was stricken to see his mother, Anticlea, among them. Mother, he cried, tell me, what brought you to this dim land? It was my longing for you, my son, she replied. Odysseus reached across the trench to comfort her. Odysseus questioned all who came, and they told him their stories. Some still hugged their envious and spites to them, like precious treasures. Some remembered golden days and tender words, but none had thought for the future, except the blind seer, Tiresias. So that's it for tonight. We will pick up with the song of the sirens next time. So sleep well. Have an even better tomorrow.